Welcome, welcome to the Good Old Days of Radio Show. This is John Tefteller, your host. It's Tuesday, and we have our final program with special guest J. David Golden, also known as Dave Golden, also known as Mr. Radio Yesteryear, and all kinds of things related to being one of the... Uh, premier old-time radio collectors in the country going way back to 1961 when he first started collecting vintage radio shows. Today we're going to do an episode of the Jack Benny Show, which is uh, Dave's favorite radio show. We did one a few weeks ago, and we're going to end our series with uh, Dave Golden with another episode of Jack Benny. But before we get to the episode of Jack Benny, I want to talk a little bit about the latter-day career of J. David Golden here. We got through the mid-70s or so, and you're issuing all these LPs, and life is good. You're selling lots and lots of LPs and lots and lots of radio shows. A lot of things are missing. Uh, Even today, there's a lot of shows that we wish exist that don't. Uh, One example would be uh, the early 15-minute Amos and Andy shows. There's not many of those around, are there? Um. Well, yes, there are. It depends on how many uh, make up many radio shows. I think I, I, I would have uh, maybe a dozen or 20 of them. Um, but no, there were hundreds, and there's still plenty missing. But the, the person to speak to, if you want to do uh, a history of Amos and Andy, is uh, Liz McLeod. She knows Amos and Andy backwards and forwards. Yeah, I was just using that as an example of it was such a popular show during the 1930s and into the 40s and 50s, and yet when you get to those 15-minute episodes, yeah, 10 or 20 of them exist, and that's about it, right? Uh, I don't know of any others, and you have to um, consider that Amos and Andy was not a comedy show in the 1920s. It was, I would say, closest to a soap opera. Uh, nobody told jokes. Um, I, I don't think uh, the grand exalted fish of the mystic nice of the sea lodge hall might have gotten a chuggle, but it was not considered a comedy by any means. Amos got arrested once, and um, he, he uh, was in romantic trouble with his wife, uh, or at that time she was his fiancée. And it, it was close to a soap opera. It was an enjoyable one. And uh, w- one of the reasons that I think Raw will be detected, and again, Elizabeth McLeod is the one to ask about Amos and Andy, is that the 15-minute shows were syndicated. Uh, they appeared on, oh, which station in, in Chicago? They left WGN, I think, to WMAQ which allowed them to press records of the program and sell them to other stations. And when you have a syndicated program being sent to many stations, the odds are better than you will fi- that you will find one or two or 20 or more of these programs sooner or later. Okay, well, it's been a long time, but I there's still programs out there. There's still programs that turn up. I find them all the time. I, I think you're still kind of looking for things. Um, I wish we knew how much more was still out there because there are some great things that are that have been found, and there's a lot of things that are missing. But you continued on dealing with radio shows and selling radio shows. In, from the 70s, that was, I guess, the 70s and 80s were the glory period of doing all that, right? Um, I'm, I'm not sure when the peak was. My accountant could probably tell you. It, it was sometime before the company ended in 1998. But as the sales of radio programs decreased, the sales of video cassettes skyrocketed. Uh, we were one of the, I was one of the first to recognize the future of video cassettes. I bought a Betamax in 1978 for Christmas. 1977, Christmas time, I bought a Betamax and said, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And by April, I had bought one for myself. And by July, I was in the video cassette business. So... Uh, video cassettes at that time were selling for upwards of sixty nine ninety five. Now that uh, may sound ridiculous, no, but that I know was that. 
the market. And uh, one of the reasons were you couldn't buy VSH blanks for love nor money. I was paying up to $25 just for the blanks and had to buy them from RCA, which didn't make any. They were selling the stuff made in Japan. But I had tons of RCA VHS cassettes that I paid dearly for. And nowadays, you can't even give them away. Nope, nobody wants them. Well, this is a, this is a program about old-time radio, so I'm going to veer you away from the VHS cassette thing. Um, there's also a story which, I again, I'm not sure you want to go into this or not, but uh, you were looking at eBay one day, and you saw some transcription discs that you had donated to the Library of Congress for sale. It's a long story, which I will try to really condense for you. Um, I had donated approximately 9,600 uh, discs to the Library of Congress and an equal amount to the National Archives. So I gave away quite a few transcriptions, uh, basically because I thought, I thought they should be preserved and I didn't feel right about trying to sell them and make a profit. I had the recordings of them, and I'm not a record collector. Now, that may seem strange to a, a John Tetzteller, but... Um, <laughs> Who uh, is a record collector, <laughs> yes. Yeah, one or two. Um, okay, so um, I gave away about 20,000 discs to the Library of Congress and the National Archives. And again, I'm trying to make this short, because it's a long story. One night, I see... Uh, a record that I know only existed once. It was an instantaneous transcription from 1937, and I saw it on eBay. And uh, it was uh, going up to uh, $34. The, the, the program was one of Babe Ruth hunting in New Jersey. And the program should have been worth a heck of a lot more than $34. But nonetheless, I knew that program is one I had given to the Library of Congress in 1976. Now, why did I know that one? Because I had assigned receipts from the Library of Congress, accepting possession of the record, and here it was being uh, sold on eBay. Long story short, I complained to the National Archives saying, if you're giving these transcriptions that I gave to you away, I want them back. And they said the, library, uh, the National Archives does not give anything away. We do not de-excess anything. We are a black hole. Once it goes in, it stays in. And what are you talking about anyway? Uh, I explained it to them and uh, with some pretty simple detective work, discovered who was selling the programs, uh, the transcription discs, uh, and at that point, it was out of my hands. The uh, federal marshals uh, seized uh, quite a few thousand of them, about 4,000 records. And uh, the um, guy who took them, who shall remain nameless, uh, who, but who I knew, uh, was um, sentenced to 18 months in jail and a, and a fine. It's a sad story. I liked the guy very much before he did that, and strangely enough, I find it hard to dislike him now. If if the words of Jesus can come to you, it's it's he who is without guilt cast the first stone. And I sure didn't want to cast any stones on this guy who I respected and still respect an awful lot. He made a mistake. Let's get on with our lives. Okay. All is that right. the uh, abridged version? That, that's abridged enough, I guess. We, we get the point. Um, I only wanted to bring that up to you because there are <laughs> you ha you have and some other people have donated a lot of transcription discs to university libraries to uh, the National Archives Library of Congress and all those places you use the term I call them black holes because they disappear there. And they don't necessarily appear on eBay. That's not what I mean. They disappear there in the, in the sense that once they go in there, they don't come out. And it takes great, great effort to get anything back out of those organizations. You have to have signed permissions from a zillion different people and different things. 
in essence, they are kind of buried there. And while I understand that you want them preserved, and I want them preserved as well, um, I'm not sure that that's exactly <laughs> what, what, what I would want to do because they're there, they're just there. You, they're, they're no longer really available to, for people to listen to. And yes, you made some tapes and all that, and, and that's great, but technology has moved on and you could get better transfers off those things and they could sound a whole lot better now, but you can't get to them and that just saddens me. Well, your, your point is very well taken, John, uh, and I can understand it, uh, except uh, I think the, the problem is uh, that not everybody should have access to everything. It's one thing to go to the Louvre and look at the Mona Lisa. Does that mean you should be able to take it home for the weekend? Yeah, no, I I get it. I get it, except that there are so many radio programs everywhere, <laughs> I mean, all over the place, due to your efforts, due to, in some ways, my efforts. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there, and a lot of it is passed around amongst people over and over and over again, and it winds up sounding terrible. And then, like, for example, I'm doing a project on the Marx Brothers and Marx Brothers on radio, and I'm trying to track down where these transcription discs went that people had access to 40, 50, 60 years ago, and I can't find them because they're buried somewhere now. They're in some archive somewhere. They've, they've gone underground someplace, can't find them, and all I can have access to are, like, multiple generation dubs from whatever, and it's just frustrating. It's just frustrating. It's almost as if they don't exist. They do exist, but they don't exist. That's that's my frustration. I, I understand completely, and I wish I could get my hands on some of the things in, in the Library of Congress. I, I once asked Jerry Gibson, who's the retired head of the audio, uh, vi audio visual department, um, how one went about getting radio program recordings from the Library of Congress. Now, this is just after, over a period of, I think, three years, donated 10,000 radio transcriptions to of the course, Library of Congress. Yeah. You gave and, them all and, this stuff, yes. And, and Jerry had a great answer. He said, you can't. You don't. <laughs> it's, it's against the rules. And I asked what I thought was a pretty nifty question. I said, Jerry, if I were to run for a representative from Sandy Hook, Connecticut, and became a member of Congress, could I hit you up for a library card so I could <laughs> check out some of these things? Oh, this is a true story. I really did. And he said, Dave, don't even think about it. It's not worth it. You're dealing with the government. And I'm sure you remember, because everybody remembers, the final scene from the Indiana Jones movie, the first one, <laughs> where the Ark of the Lost Covenant, which is almost as valuable as old radio shows, uh, is put in a wooden box, and the camera pulls back, and there are tens of thousands of wooden boxes in a government warehouse. So, it, yes, it, it's, a, it's a thing that I've lived with oh, since at least the, the third uh, generation of, of the Egyptian pharaohs. And uh, it's something that, hey, that's it. It's one of the facts of life. Let's get around it. And let's get more than they have and better copies, too. Yes, if we can. And, of course, that's what I try to do. But I'm sitting here, as I think I've told you in the past, I'm sitting here right now in my studio surrounded by boxes after boxes after boxes of 16-inch radio transcriptions, a lot of which I have not touched in all the years they've been here. They're just sitting here. Uh, but I can't bring myself to donate them anywhere because I feel they're just going to go into a black hole and no one's ever going to get to hear them. Um, again, I have to agree with you. Um, it is a, a bad feeling, but listen, what will you do with them? You can either sell them on eBay or something else, which would be a terrible pain to do, or you can give it to someplace where it will be safe, whether or not 
the grubby public can get their hands on it. <laughs> well, I know, and I know that there are a lot of people, and I'm sure you know this, that look at your Radio Golden Index and just salivate over a lot of things on there, and they probably inundate you with requests for copies of these things, and you can't possibly honor all those requests. You can't. <laughs> you just can't. So it becomes just kind of frustrating for some people because they'll look at your your list and say, well, this exists, but he's got it. How do I get it? How do I get it? Uh, yeah, it's absolutely true. I can't argue with you with this also, but then again, you don't have to get it. Um, you're not entitled to the Mona Lisa. You're not entitled <laughs> to Egyptian artifacts. You can look at pictures of them. You can get copies of them. But damn it, I've spent a few dollars on these things, as you have. Of course. And you just don't want to enter into a public service by saying, of course, you, as the public, have every right to have a copy of this stuff. Uh, y yes, it, it, it would be nice if you could. It's impractical from a monetary point of view, as well as from a physical point of view. So how many copies of the Constitution are in the Library of Congress. I think about nine or ten, something like that. Well, should everybody have an original copy of the Constitution, or is a Xerox enough? Yeah, no, I, I know. It, it's just one of those things, and it becomes just frustrating for me because I have all the legal permissions to be able to use the Marx Brothers things. I just can't access those darn disks. Well, if it was easy, it wouldn't be as much fun. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to go on to listen to a final program here, and then we'll wrap up with you. Uh, this is going to be the Jack Benny Show, and this is one that um, I'm sure you've heard at one point, but maybe you haven't heard it in a long time. It's from February 1st, 1948. There's nothing you can say about it other than it's your favorite guy, Jack Benny, who I also happen to admire a lot. Um, the only time I ever saw Jack Benny in person, I'll just tell this story real quick, on December 11th of 1972, Groucho Marx, at the age of 80-something, gave a performance at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles. Uh, he was not in the best of shape. He had had a stroke a little bit before this and was really not in a, a kind of a condition to perform a one-man show, but he did. And my, I persuaded my parents to get tickets to this one-man show, which they did. And we sat in the row just above Jack Benny and George Burns, who were sitting together to watch Groucho's performance that day. So I did get to wave to Jack Benny, but I didn't get to have lunch with him like you did. Did you throw popcorn down on I him? I didn't throw popcorn down on him either, no. So, here we go. Jack Benny Show, and then we'll wrap up with you with some final, final comments and questions, and thank you so much. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. <laughs> Front page news. In the nation's great tobacco markets, the famous Crosley Poll has just finished asking independent tobacco experts, What cigarette do you smoke? Over 50% more named Lucky Strike than any other brand. Yes, by a 50% margin over any other brand, independent tobacco experts name Lucky Strike first choice. Lucky Strike, first choice. These experts are the independent tobacco buyers, auctioneers, and warehousemen, the men who see who buys what tobacco at the auctions. And when independent tobacco experts like these name Lucky Strike, first choice, for personal smoking enjoyment, then you know. L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So smoke the smoke, tobacco experts smoke, Lucky Strike. Remember, by a 50% margin over any other brand, Independent tobacco experts name Lucky Strike first choice. Lucky Strike first choice. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, last night was a big night in Hollywood. The occasion was a special showing of Ronald Coleman's new picture, A Double Life. 
Naturally, all the important stars in Hollywood received invitations to attend this gala affair. And while all this was going on, where was our little star? Uh, Rochester, hand me my pajamas. I'm going to bed. Here you are, boys. No, 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 my woolen ones. The nights are awfully cold. I know it's cold, but you've already got three comforters, two quilts, an afghan, and four electric blankets with a direct line to Boulder Dam. <laughs> Never mind. Just turn out the lights and I'll go to sleep. Don't you want me to read to you like I always do? Yes. Uh, pick up one of those trade papers, either the variety or the reporter. There okay. Now, let's see. Say, boss, look what it says. What? Tonight at the Academy Theater, there will be a special showing of Ronald Coleman's new Universal International picture, A Double Life. I know, I know. It says all the big stars in Hollywood have been, have been invited to attend. Yeah, I know. Didn't they mail you an invitation? Well, frankly, I don't know whether they did or not. I, I didn't even bother looking. Oh, boss, come now. <laughs> what? This morning, when the mailman came by, you grabbed his bag and went through it like an octopus with a mix master in each hand. I was looking for a reply from Dorothy Dix. <laughs> anyway, who wants to go to a Hollywood premiere? You always see the same people. Barbara Stanwyck will be there with Robert Taylor. Lauren Bacall will be there with Humphrey Bogart. Lana Turner will be there with... Let me see today's paper. <laughs> anyway, Rochester, believe me, I'm not mad because I didn't get an invitation to the preview. As a matter of fact, if Universal Studios, if William Getz, the executive producer, if Ronald Coleman himself called me on the phone right now, I wouldn't go to that... I'll get it, Rochester, I'll get it. Hello? <laughs> Is this Sam's Meat Market? No, it isn't. <laughs> Who was it, boss? Oh, some guy wanted Sam's Meat Market. Sam's Meat Market? That's the new place down the corner. They're having a big opening tonight. They are? Didn't you get an invitation to that either? <laughs> I wouldn't go if I did. You always see the same things. Yeah. Liver will be there with bacon. Sirloin will be there Now, cut that out. <laughs> Now, Rochester, I'm going to bed, so turn out the light, will you? You'll get it, boss. You'll get it. I've got it. Hello? Hello, Jack. This is Mary. Oh, hello, Mary. I'm glad I caught you. I thought maybe you had already left to see Ronald Coleman's picture. Uh, no, Mary. I was supposed to go, but I don't know. When you've been a star as long as I have, you don't, you don't get excited about those things, you know? Gee, and I thought we could go together. Mm, no, no, Mary. I'm ready for bed. Oh, that's too bad. I have two tickets. What, 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 what was that, Mary? What, 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 what did you say, what, what did you say, Mary? What? I said I've got, 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 got to say tickets around the whole street here. Mary, just because you got tickets, you don't have to be so nervous about it. Look, I was ready for bed, but I wouldn't let you down, so while I get dressed, you jump in a cab and pick me up in ten minutes. Okay, Jack. I may be a few minutes late, I want to stop off at the florist and get a corsage. Good, good. <laughs> while you're there, get one for yourself, too. <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, I mean... Come over as soon as you can. Goodbye. Rochester! Rochester, I'm going to the opening. I knew Sam wouldn't let you down. <laughs> Not the meat market. Now stop jabbering and help me dress. Hiya, Jackson. The door was open, so I came right in. Oh, hello, Phil. Where are you going? Oh, I promised Mary I'd take her to a special showing of Ronald Coleman's new picture. No kidding, Jackson. You mean you got an invitation? I certainly did. That's why I'm putting on this tuxedo. You may not know it, Phil, but for the past 20 years, I've been rubbing elbows with the most important people in show business. From the looks of them sleeves, you must have been rubbing them pretty hard. <laughs> All right, so it's a little thin around the elbows. Now, pardon me while I get dressed, will I'll you? I'll help you, Jackson. While you're putting on your shirt, I'll button your shoes. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Oh, Rochester, hand me my wing collar, will you please? Yes, sir. Uh-oh. What's the matter? You wear a size 15 and a half collar, and this is only a 14. Oh, that's all right. We can make it work. Put it on. Okay. Here's the collar button. Yeah, I got it. Now, hold still. Boy, this collar's really stiff. Yeah. Just a minute now. Mm. There, I got it. Yeah. How's that, boss? I, I guess it's all right, but it's so tight I can hide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
darn it slipped off the collar button. Uh, try it again, Rochester. Boss, this collar's too tight for you. Well, pull it harder. I'm getting it. I'm getting... Hold still. There. Gosh, this collar's so tight I can hardly breathe. Phil, how do I look? Like Herbert Hoover with a crew haircut. <laughs> Don't be so funny. Oh, there's Mary. Now, all I have to do is snap on this bow tie, and I'll be on my way. <laughs> Darn it. There it goes again. Rochester, where's my bow tie? It went out the window and headed for Capistrano. <laughs> <laughs> well, get me another one. Coming, Mary, coming. Phil, can I drop you off any place? No, Jackson, I'll stay here. I'm a little hungry. Rochester, get me an olive and a glass. <laughs> Okay, Phil, make yourself at home, will you? Say, Mary, don't look now, but ever since we've been riding in this cab, there's been a moving van following us. I know. What? So many times I've gone to the theater and found out I left the tickets on the piano. So this time I'm taking the piano with me. <laughs> Say, you know, Mary, that's a oh, good... Oh, quiet. You fall for everything. <laughs> I've got the tickets right here. <laughs> and the invitations, too. Well, let me see. <clears throat> Universal International cordially invites you to attend a special showing of A Double Life starring Ronald Coleman. Say, gee, gee, that's a really beautiful invitation. Isn't it? Here you are, folks. Academy Theater. Come on, Mary. How much is that, driver? A dollar sixty. <laughs> oh, darn it. Jack, what happened? Nothing, nothing. Here you are, driver. Keep the change. Thanks. Jack, fix your collar. I'm trying to, but darn it, I've lost my bow tie. No, you haven't. They've got the searchlight on it. It'll be down in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Here it comes. There. I got it. Oh, no, that's the one that was headed for Capistrano. <laughs> there it is. Fix my collar. <clears throat> Wait, there. Come on, Mary, let's go in. Gosh, look, look, all of us big stars are here. Come on, hurry. Hold your own invitations, please. You spectators, stand back. Let them in. How do you do, Mr. Gable? Good evening, Mr. Taylor. How are you, Mr. Peck? How do you do, Miss Livingston? I told you spectators to stand back. I'm with her! <laughs> Oh, well then go right in, mister Mister <laughs> He doesn't even know I'm Jack Benny Well, don't tell him, have something to look forward to What? Come on, Jack, hurry, the lights are starting to dim Okay Hey, Mary, here are two seats here, right in this row A little more than halfway in Follow me Pardon me, pardon me, pardon me Pardon me, pardon me Pardon me, pardon me Pardon me, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me Oh, darn it, there's only one seat. <laughs> we'll have to go back. Pardon me, pardon me. Pardon me, pardon me. Pardon me, pardon me. Pardon me, pardon me. Uh, pardon me, pardon me. Pardon me, pardon me. Pardon me, pardon me. Jack, come back, you went out the exit. <laughs> oh, yes. Here we are, Mary. Here are two seats on the aisle. Good. Gee, Jack, we just made it. The travelogue is coming on. Oh, yes. As the sun comes up over the famous diamond head in Honolulu, we pay another visit to that land of enchantment resting far out in the blue Pacific, the Hawaiian Islands. Well, Jack, Jack. Huh? It's me, Don Wilson. Oh, hello, Don. I didn't see you sitting behind me. Who are you with? Your quartet, the sportsman. Oh, good, good. And now let us pay a brief visit to one of the lesser-known islands, where we find Chief Huma Nukanduai and his people doing their native dance. Gee, this is good, isn't it, Mary? Jack, Jack. Don, I want to see this travelogue. Shh, quiet back there. Yes, Don, quiet. You're disturbing the people. But Jack, what a coincidence. The quartet has a commercial worked out that fits to the music they're playing. All right, all right. But, Don, not now. We're in a theater. Not now. 
Now, good. Don. Go Don. ahead, fellas. Very softly. Don, Don, we're in the theater. I can't hear him. Don, you can't do this. We're in a theater. Make the boys be quiet. Yeah, quiet back there. Don, it's so embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. Lucky strike. One we like. Firm and fully packed. Mighty free and easy on the draw. Speedy rings. the smoke a lucky strike. We smoke. Lucky strike. What's the matter with you? Quiet! 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 Quality of product is essential to continuing success. Lucky not made of the fine, of the light tobacco we confess. Hell is 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 hell
You know, Ronnie, my favorite scene in the whole picture was when you, as a fellow, accused your wife, Desdemona, of being unfaithful because you saw another man carrying her handkerchief. Oh, you mean the speech where I said, by heaven, I saw the handkerchief in his hand. Oh, perjured woman, thou dost tone my heart and makes me call what I intend to do a murder, which I thought a sacrifice. I saw the handkerchief. Yes, yes, that's the speech I mean. Only, Ronnie, if I were playing the part, <laughs> I believe I would have done it something like this. By heaven. <laughs> I saw the handkerchief in his hand. Oh, perjured with him. I just stole my heart and makes me call what I intend to do a murder. <laughs> Which I thought a sacrifice. I saw the hanky. <laughs> there, how did that sound? Wonderful. Phil Harris couldn't have read it better. He couldn't have read it at all. <laughs> but Ronnie, how can you say that? Look, get the depth of that last line. I saw... <laughs> oh, there goes my collar again. Where's my bow tie? I swallowed it. <laughs> no, no, here it is on the sidewalk. Excuse me a minute. Hmm, where's my collar button? I knew I swallowed something. Well, I got another one here in my vest pocket. Oh, say, Ronnie. Ronnie, if you don't mind my talking about your picture again. Oh, not at all, not at all. Well, I've seen you in a lot of pictures, and... I thought that in this one, you were, you were... Well, thank you. No, no, let me finish. Let me finish. I, uh, I thought that you were miscast. Oh. So you, you thought I was miscast? Yes. You see, in the picture, they have you turn killer and commit murder. And Ronnie in real life, I mean, you, you couldn't possibly murder anybody. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Getting late. We'd better be running along. No, no, Benita. No, no. You can't go home yet. This is the opening of Ronnie's new picture. A night like this calls for a celebration. I know. Let's all go over to my house and play the slot machine. No, no thanks. <laughs> no thanks. Benita and I are going to Ciro's. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, Jack, it's getting kind of late. Maybe we ought to go home. Mary, we can't run off and leave the Coleman's. They'll think I'm snubbing them. <laughs> now, now we'll all go to Ciro's. Come on, come on, everybody. Oh, taxi, taxi. Look, look, Jack, we can't all get into one taxi. There are four of us. Okay, you folks take this cab. Mary and I will take the next one. See you at Ciro's. Oh, Benita, what a fool I was to let Benny know where we were going. Oh, what's the difference, darling? And anyway, Mary's such a nice girl. Oh, I have nothing against her. I like Mary. It's that Benny I can't stand. <laughs> and lately, it seems that everywhere I go, I run into him. It happens to me, too. Last Thursday afternoon, I saw him at Greer Garson's tea. Benny? At a tea party for women? Yes. He had a shawl over his head and came around to tell our fortune. <laughs> no. Yes. Then he took his violin, played golden earrings, and passed around a tambourine. You mean Benny himself passed the tambourine? Yes. Well, that's too bad. His monkey must have died. <laughs> Look, darling, let's forget about him. Let's talk about us. About us? Mm. You know, I didn't have a chance to tell you how much I enjoyed Double Life. Oh. I think it is the finest picture you've ever made. Uh, well, thank you very much, darling. I mean, you know, I'm your severest critic. I think your performance in that picture was magnificent. Well. You, you're wonderful. Oh. And Ronnie. Yes? I bought a new fur coat. <laughs> what did you say, dear? I said I thought your performance in the picture uh, was... Here we are, what? Cyril. Uh, you're certainly lucky to get this ringside table. Yes, I hear they have a wonderful floor show. Well, it was nice we all arrived together and no one was kept waiting. Yes, yes, uh, it was, wasn't it? Say, Jack, it's kind of chilly in here. Will you please get me my coat? Certainly, Mary. What about you, Benita? Is your coat checked? 
No, it's Persian lamb. <laughs> <laughs> Say, that, that's rather good, Benita. Yes, I know. I heard it on Fred Allen's program. <laughs> ordering our food so we'll be through eating when the floor show starts. All right, I'll call the waiter. Oh, waiter, waiter. Yeah. <laughs> waiter, I'll have a shrimp cocktail, filet mignon rare, and asparagus. Uh, very good, madame. I'll have a Caesar salad, lobster a la Newburgh, and broccoli. Yes, madame. I think I'll have some consomme, prime ribs of beef, medium rare, and a baked potato. Uh, yes, sir. And now, what about you, shoulders? <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll have a uh, potage jour at salade avec Roquefort, a la bouffe avec Bordelais, a pomme de terre. Well, get here! <laughs> Never mind the comment, just bring what I ordered. Uh, say, Jack, when did you start eating French food? Since they devaluated the franc. <laughs> Uh, would you like something to drink with your dinner? We have some wonderful vintage champagne. Mums 37, Cordon Rouge 33, and Piper Heidsick 35. Uh, make mine Schlitz 47. <laughs> that, uh, that was a good year, wasn't it? Not for USC. <laughs> Look, I never... Never mind the wisecrack. You, you ought to pay a little more attention to your job. Some waiter. Look at this tablecloth and the napkins. I've never seen such dirty linen. Well, you do them for us, Wong Fu. <laughs> That's besides the point. I've never seen such a rude, impertinent waiter. I got a good Stop mind... Stop raising your voice to me. What? Nobody asked you to come in here in the first place. You spoiled my whole evening. <laughs> That's the last straw. How about you and me stepping outside? This is Ciro's. We can do it right here. <laughs> Look, waiter, just go get our orders. Oh, you, all right. <laughs> Ronnie, you can come out from under the table. People have stopped staring. <laughs> well, now, let us all have a pleasant evening. Come on. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> Well, that was really a delicious dinner. Did you enjoy yours, Ronnie? Yeah, I certainly did. Uh, waiter, give me the check, please. Oh, no, 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 Ronnie. This is, uh, this is my little party. Oh, but after all, Jack, we're celebrating my new picture. I don't care. Waiter, don't listen to him. Uh, give me the check. All right, but you'll hate yourself in the morning. <laughs> Never mind. Give it to me. Thank you. Hey, Ronnie, this is the first time I've ever seen Jack pick up a check. I wonder what happened. Somebody must have spiked his schlitz. <laughs> a waiter, give me your pencil. I want to check these items. <laughs> Thank you. Now let's see. You know, this really has been a grand evening. Yes, the floor show is wonderful. And Kugar's music is so exciting. And this Jerry Lester, such a funny comedian. And the atmosphere is nice and cozy. Please, please, would you all be quiet? I'm going over the check. <laughs> Now, let's see. Shrimp cocktail, a dollar. Consomme, 85 cents. Caesar salad, a dollar and a quarter. Filet mignon. Whoops! <laughs> hmm. Lobster. They, hmm. 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 Ronnie. Ronnie, did you have an extra cup of coffee? No, Jack, I had milk. Well, where did this extra cup of coffee come from, waiter? You ordered it. I didn't order it, and I want it taken off the bill. Oh, Jack, please. Now, you keep out of this, Mary. Waiter, I'm not going to pay for this extra cup of coffee. I want uh, no, to... No, Jack, Jack, let me pay the check. No, no, Ronnie, this is my party. This is my party. Now, look, waiter. I don't mind paying for what we got. 
But I know that no one here had an extra cup of coffee. Oh, Jack, for heaven's sake. I'll have this bill corrected immediately. Ronnie, the orchestra's playing. Let's dance our way out the back door. All right. You need to come quick. Hurry up. Now, what about it, waiter? You ordered the coffee and you'll pay for it. I ordered it, but I changed my mind and you took it back. Did you see me leave the table with it? Yes. By heaven, I saw the coffee in your hand. <laughs> oh, perjured waiter. What? Thou dost stole my heart. And makes me call what I intend to do a murder. Well. Which I thought a sacrifice. I saw the coffee. <laughs> oh, darn it. There goes my collar. Jack will be back in just a minute, but first, here's Basil Rysdale. By a 50% margin over any other brand, independent tobacco experts name Lucky Strike first choice. Lucky Strike first choice. Back of that statement is an impartial Crosley poll just completed in 11 southern tobacco states. This famous authentic research group reveals that when independent tobacco experts choose a cigarette for their own personal smoking enjoyment, over 50% more named Lucky Strike than any other brand. Yes, by a 50% margin over any other brand, independent tobacco experts name Lucky Strike first choice. These are the tobacco experts, the independent buyers, auctioneers, and warehousemen who buy, sell, and handle tobacco at the auctions. Men like Mr. Sidney T. Curran, tobacco warehouseman of Oxford, North Carolina, who recently said, At auction after auction, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy fine tobacco that smokes up mild, cool, and fragrant. I've smoked Lucky's myself for 26 years. So for your own real, deep-down smoking enjoyment, remember... L-S-M-F-T! L-S-M-F-T! Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. So smoke the smoke, tobacco expert smoke. Remember, by a 50% margin over any other brand, independent tobacco experts name Lucky Strike first choice. Lucky Strike first choice. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman for being with us tonight. And to Dennis Day, my best wishes and congratulations. Good night, folks. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Okay, the Jack Benny show there. Had you do you remember hearing that one before, Mr. Dave? I haven't remembered listening to every one of them, <laughs> but it sure was funny, wasn't it? Yeah, it's it's great stuff. I like Jack Benny a lot. Um, all right, well, we're going to, um, I'm going to ask you a couple other things, and then we're going to wrap up. You've been very generous with your time uh, doing all these uh things here and i hope it comes out good for you too basically i wanted to touch on you went out of the old time radio business in the late 90s and that was now 20 some years ago you created the radio golden index when did that come about and what was uh, what was that all about uh, that's a good question. That uh, started about 1961 when I decided to make up a list of all the programs that I had so that I wouldn't keep trying to find the same ones over again. I started on a portable typewriter from Macy's. I graduated into an IBM Selectric. I then went to a Philips word processor and finally, a real-life computer. And the, the whole Radio Gold Index is basically a list of the programs that I've found and listened to over the years. And that's it. There's nothing special to it. It's not supposed to be a list of every radio program uh, that has been found. It's only the ones that I've listened to. So that's basically it. It's a list of my stuff. Right. But a lot of people use that. Uh, as like the go-to source when a new program 
we think a new program, somebody th- finds a new program or a new disc or whatever, and they go, oh, well, let's look up. Let's see if it, if it appears on the Radio Golden Index, because if it does, it means it's not unique. It's not something that hasn't been found previously. Well, consider that a small gift to the many other people who collect old radio shows, as they have given me many large gifts. It's a little payback. You're welcome, guys. Okay. Well, I think it's an amazing achievement because you can look at that, and even though, yes, it's only the shows that you've found, there's a lot of programs on there. It's very well organized. It's very easy to search. It's it's an, a pretty amazing achievement to, to do that, and that, I think, is what's going to be your legacy, sir. <laughs> well, for sure. Anybody could have done it in 60 years. Yeah, anybody could have done it, but you did it. You were the one that did it, and it's going to stand out there on the Internet forever. Now, there's a lot of um, radio programs that are now just being... Uh, uploaded to these internet archives and all that stuff and it's all pretty much free now there's not many people selling radio shows anymore there's uh, not enough money in it there's not enough interest in that type of thing because there's so much stuff available for free Uh, it's sad because those of us who've paid a lot of money for transcription discs and spent a lot of time preserving them and all that you can't really recoup it it's hard there's not a there's not a way to do that now I I agree, and I'm still very glad to have been in at the beginning. It was never any uh, choice for me. It was just the natural thing to do. I love radio, and if I can make a living at it as well as having fun with it, why not? Well, sure. Uh, I I take it that means you have no regrets looking back on your, your years doing all this. Well, I kind of regret marrying my first wife, but I don't think that's what you meant. (laughs) No, that's not exactly (laughs) what I meant. Any regrets in relation to your work in vintage radio and things like that? No. (laughs) Yeah, I do do have a regret, and and that is I, I priced myself out of being a radio engineer. That's all I ever wanted to be, and... Working for three of the four networks, you couldn't get much better, much higher in, in radio engineering. I worked for small stations, and so three of the four radio networks, what more could a radio engineer want? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I guess you can call that a regret, but you still had a, a, a great, uh, great life dealing with all these radio programs and all that stuff, so... I'm sure, I'm sure that gave you lots and lots of pleasure. And still more. To, as soon as we hang up, I'm going to listen to a couple of old radio shows. Oh, you haven't had enough? Okay. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear you're, you're uh, doing well. And uh, for all those listeners out there, if you need to research a program, try the Radio Golden Index. That will help you. Um, how did you got to ask this how did you get identify all those voices uh, on your on your index you have a lot of the voices on the programs that are not given in the credits yet you list the voices are you a really good you have a really good ear for voices or how did you come up with that no I, i'm not a really good ear for voices and the credits given on most of the programs are those which are spoken at the front or the end of the program. For example, if, if uh, John Smith is the director of uh, the Jack Benny show and he gets the credit every week, John Smith, directed by John Smith. John, well, if I don't hear it one week, I will leave it off because it may be somebody else directing that particular show. So I try to be as factual as I possibly can. If I can see it, smell it, touch it, feel it, then I put it in. If there's any doubts about it, either I leave it out or I indicate what my doubts are. Okay, and you're still adding to the Radio Golden Index? You're still um, acquiring more programs, right? I certainly am, and if you ask yourself, which would you rather watch, network television or listening to radio shows, it, it, there's no, no contest. 
And do you still have a what a large backlog of transcription discs that you haven't had a chance to record and put up on your index, or are we getting close to the end? No, I'm, I, I'm delighted to say I'm not even close to the end, and I'm falling further and further behind. Uh, I'm still buying transcriptions. Uh, I'm still uh, obtaining them off the Internet if the quality is good enough. And uh, I enjoy listening to radio shows. It doesn't matter where it comes from. I'd rather have it complete, and I'd rather have it sounding good. But I, I wouldn't kick Arg Son of Fire out of bed. Uh, it's that kind of thing. If it's rare enough, I would love to hear it. Okay. Well, that's a great attitude, and you've been very generous with your time here. Um, four, four, four programs with the good old days of radio show. That, that's very nice of you to do that. I appreciate it very much. It's nice to know you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to go over your life story here because there's a whole lot of people out there that – are younger collectors and 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 are into this uh, material, but they don't really realize where a lot of this originated or who some of the pioneers in collecting these radio shows were. I didn't come along till 1972, so I'm 10 years uh, 10 years after you. It's just interesting, and I hope that people enjoy this. I think they will, and I thank you f- so much for appearing with me on the Good Old Days of Radio Show for these times. What. One more thought. Ah, you got one more thing. Okay. One more thought. I'd like to leave with people who are just beginning to collect old radio shows, uh, and that is you don't have to have everything. Find out what you like and enjoy and stick to that. Well, that's great advice. That's what I tell record collectors, too. And in fact, I've, I've had some conversations with you, Dave, about the fact that I don't have tens and hundreds of thousands of radio shows here. I, I do have a lot of transcription discs, as I said, a lot of which have never been transferred uh, from the transcription disc into any kind of way to listen to them in a modern fashion. Um, but I do have my favorite radio shows, and I concentrate on those, and I look for those, and I do not get distracted with things that don't interest me. I don't want 10 million radio shows just because they're radio shows. And so your advice is exactly what I tell to people who are collecting anything, is don't just pile up stuff everywhere uh, just to do it. Take what you like, enjoy what you like, and leave the rest for other people. Like me. Like you, yeah. (laughs) You want it all. (laughs) <laughs> you're advising everybody like else to be selective and not to, not not to have a lot of shows but you want every single one you can get your hands on right uh, unfortunately i will never ever get to hear the last radio show to be found and that's okay as long as i hear the ones that i want to hear like jack benny okay and 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 i there's a few Jack Benny shows missing, but not too many. Most of them have been found, I believe. Is that correct? I, I don't know. Yeah, well, I think so. I mean, there was a large run of them that used to be at UCLA that came from Benny himself, and most of those did get transferred and are out there circulating around, and then there's been others since. But either way, there's a lot of Jack Benny out there for people to enjoy, and since it's your favorite show, I hope you get each and every one of them and never miss one. Thank you, and may God bless us, each and every one. Thank you, Tiny Tim. (laughs) (laughs) And thanks for appearing with me. It's been fun. Thank you so much, and um, we'll just keep keep on keeping on, looking to preserve more shows. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. All right. Have a great night, and thanks to um, your wife for giving us over, giving you over to us for the good old days of radio show. This is John Tefteller with a special guest, J. David Golden, or Dave Golden. And thank you all for listening, and we'll be back next week with more Vintage Radio. ¶¶